Sydney Metro, Sydney's new and somewhat controversial network. While I have my own opinions on it, it'd be best to delve into its history first. So where did it come from? Why was it built? And who do we have to thank and or blame for it? Well, that's today's video. So to begin, we all know where this starts. I don't even have to say his name. David Hay of the British engineering firm Mott and Hay. Okay, I know no one, at least in Australia, has ever heard of this guy because I'm a nerd for this stuff and I never heard of him before I started researching my Eastern Suburbs Railway video. But he did write a report in 1912 that put forth the first metro style proposal for Sydney. Part of his proposal was for the City Circle, which all based on the 1909 Royal Commission's proposal of stops at Central, Town Hall, Wynyard Square, Circular Quay, St James and Elizabeth Street. He instead proposed stops at Goulburn Street, Town Hall, Wynyard Square, Circular Quay, Post Office Mall Street and Bathurst Street, which would be served by mainline trains. Where his plan differed was in regards to the Eastern Suburbs and Western Suburbs line. While the original 1909 Royal Commission proposed using normal mainline trains, Hay wanted them to be suburban lines. So what did he mean by that? Well, he uses them the same way we'd use rapid transit or metro today, which just goes to show how early this was. These suburban lines would run under or close to the street and would use smaller dedicated trains akin to the deep level tube in London. The Eastern Suburbs line was started at Wynyard Square before running under York Street to Town Hall and then turned down Bathurst Street and under Hyde Park where it reaches Liverpool Street Station before turning onto Oxford Street before following it to Bondi Junction with stops at Darlinghurst, Paddington, Wollara, Centennial Park and of course Bondi Junction. The other line was the Western Suburbs line which began at Town Hall from there, it would head north to a station at the General Post Office in Martin Place, before turning west to a station at Millers Point. Interestingly, this was just north of where the current Barangaroo station is. After that, it would head under Darling Harbour onto Balmain, where it would loop around with a stop at Leichhardt, then turning east down Parramatta Road with stops at Parramatta Road and the University of Sydney, before turning up George Street and stopping at Railway Square. Finally, reconnecting at Town Hall, forming a loop. So why am I focusing so much on this to start off with? Well, it was the first plan for a dedicated heavy rail system operating at high frequencies to move people around Sydney, which is the textbook definition of a metro. And on the topic of frequencies, Hayes' plan called for 3 minute frequencies on the city circle and 1.5 minute frequencies in future with signalling upgrades, while his suburban lines were to push 1.5 minute frequencies from the start. This sounds pretty good considering Sydney Metro today only does 5 minute frequencies in peak. And it was feasible as the London Underground and New York City subway could do it back then. This was all with basic electrical signalling and trip cocks. So eat your heart out Sydney Metro, be from 100 years ago have you beat. I also want to focus on it because no one has really heard of this report. Which is a shame because while it was rejected, it was what John Bradfield built his 1916 report on. Speaking of John Bradfield, in 1914, he went on an overseas tour of foreign railway systems to advise Sydney on upgrading and electrifying the suburban network. While he visited many, the network he took a liking to the most was the New York City subway. As such, his vision in 1916 and later reports was for a rapid transit network spanning across all of Sydney in the same way the New York City subway did for New York. Early train designs were even based on IRT subway cars, which would push 48 trains per hour frequencies or a train every 1 minute and 15 seconds through the city circle and across the harbour. As you can probably guess, he also dropped Hay's proposal for smaller, dedicated trains. By 1921, when the first Bradfield cars were delivered, they had a distinct rapid transit-esque design. Obviously, this was dropped when the later Standard, Tullox and Sputniks were delivered, but it's still important to discuss this, as the work of Hay and Bradfield show that the Metro began with the suburban network, both in the way Hay used the term and the way we use it today. Moving forward, in the 1960s, things would begin to change. The suburban network was beginning to feel the strain. Trains were full and lines were congested. Sydney needed a new option. So, in comes the double-deckers. In 1964, Tullock delivered its first double-decker trailer car, which proved successful, and the order was extended. This helped to relieve the pressure, and in 1968, the motor car prototypes arrived, of which one prototype proved best and then later became the basis of the S sets and after that, all new suburban trains would be double deck. If you're sensing that I'm skipping some details, it's because I am. I've got to say something for my Tullock and S set video after all. Anyway, 
While the double deckers relieved the pressure, they weren't the silver bullet Sydney needed. They traded sitting capacity for dwell times. So, something new was needed. In 1968, the Sydney Region Outline Plan was published. This was the second master plan for Sydney, after the 1948 County of Cumberland Plan, and amongst other things, set forth a metro proposal. It didn't go into much detail or a layout of route. It only specified that a new rapid transit line along the CBD, Parramatta and Penrith corridor, as well as other unspecified routes, should be built sometime in the next 30 years. You may be thinking, that sounds a lot like Sydney Metro West. And you'd be right, it's the same corridor, albeit the line is set to terminate at Westmead, but it goes just to show how long this corridor was on the cards for. As you can probably guess, this never happened. The projected population growth in the plan was much greater than in reality, and a system of urban sprawl along the existing rail corridors meant that downside of double-deckers were mitigated. As such, upgrades to the existing rail network took priority, and no progress on a metro was made, at least for the time being. In 1974, the Sydney Area Transport Study was released, and apart from proposing American-style highways everywhere, also fleshed out that central to Parramatta line, with it being called the Parramatta Express, which began at Parramatta before joining a rebuilt Carlingford line to Rose Hill, and then east to Silverwater, Concord, Five Dock, Annandale, and then joining the main suburban line at McDonaldtown or Redfern and connecting onto the Illawarra local tracks. There was also a new proposal for a new line from Westmead to Northmead, Winston Hills, Balcombe Hills, West Castle Hill, Kellyville, Rouse Hill, Riverston East, Boundary Road, Oakvale South, and then it would branch into two, with one going south to Box Hill and reconnecting to the Richmond line at Riverston, while the other branch would continue west and reconnect at Mulgrave. Now this next part is not strictly relevant, but I want to discuss additional proposals from this report. The first was a line that began in Maryland, providing southwest to Chetwind, Kenyons Road, Smithfield, Westfield, St. John's Park, Bonnie Rig, and then terminating at Green Valley. The other is a Carlingford extension, which would see it press north to Murray Farm before connecting to the main north line at Beecroft, which is reminiscent of the later Parramatta Rail Link. There are other interesting items in this report, but I'll save them for a future video. I also did need to note that all the proposals here were for suburban lines, not metro lines. The phrase rapid transit is only used in the report to refer to pod vehicles, like you'd find at airports and that one weird town in West Virginia. Anyway, as the 1970s passed and the Cold War hit its height, it became clear a new plan would be needed. And this would be the 1988 Sydney into its third century report, which apart from sounding really cool, set forth a policy of urban consolidation. Sydney would no longer sprawl outwards, it would rise up. While the 1988 plan made no suggestion of a metro, the increased urban density it created would make one much more viable. Now we're 995, there's a new Premier, Bob Carr, member of the Labour right faction, former planning minister and now Premier, and he's in government primarily thanks to three electorates, those being Badgerys Creek, Blue Mountains and Gladesville. So if he wants to stay in government, he needed to keep the West happy. But another priority was on the horizon, the 2000 Olympics. As such, building the Olympic Park Line and Airport Link took priority, with them opening in 1998 and 2000 respectively. In 1998, the car ministry put forth its own plan, called Action for Transport 2010, which consisted of the following works. First, the aforementioned Airport Link opened in 2000, and then the Bondi Beach Link to open in 2002. Stay tuned for my Eastern Suburbs Line video, because some juicy stuff about that one. Next, we have the Parramatta Rail Link, which started at Chatswood, making its way west underground through Macquarie Park and Macquarie University, with two optional stops at UTS Kurungai and Delhi Road, before reaching Epping, with it then heading to a new underground station at Carlingford, before surfacing once again and following the Carlingford line until Camellia, where instead of heading to Clyde via Rose Hill, it headed west to Parramatta, and this line was set to open by 2006. Building Beautifully actually did a whole video on this if you're curious, so give it a watch after this. Next was the Epping to Castle Hill line, which headed northwest through a tunnel to two new stations called West Pennant Hills and Castle Hill, and this was set to open by 2010. Next we have a biggie, the Hurstville to Strathfield line. This will start at Hurstville, winding north in a tunnel to Kingsgrove, and then Campsey, and then Strathfield, with optional stations at Croydon Park, Enfield, South Strathfield, and South Belmore, and this was to open by 2014. And our final project was the Liverpool Y-Link, which would connect the main south to the East Hills line at Glenfield, and allow trains from Liverpool to run to the city via the airport in Reesby, and this was to open by 2010. To be honest, I'm surprised I haven't done this project since. It seems like a good project, but alas. 
Now there's two good reasons I've talked about this in detail. The first being, it's cool. With the second being that even though these are still suburban lines at this point, you can see the bones that would become the current city metro. The current Northwest Metro follows the exact route aforementioned between Castle Hill, Chatswood, and Epping. You can also see politics in the mix, as most of these projects benefit the West, which Carr desperately needed on his side. So, the political will is there, and so is a plan, so things should go smoothly, and they would, at least until December 1999. On the 2nd of December 1999, the Sydney-bound Indian Pacific was making its way through Glenbrook Station, where it encountered automatic signal 41.6. At 8.04am, which is that stop, assuming the Indian Pacific had caught up with the train in front, the drivers waited. When it didn't change, one of the locomotive drivers then proceeded to disembark and use the wayside phone to contact the control box at Penrith to get permission to pass the signal. At the time, using the wayside phone was the only way the Indian Pacific was authorised to communicate with the signal at Penrith. At 8.11, the Indian Pacific was authorised to proceed with caution. At 8.19, it arrived at the next signal, 40.8, which is also at stop. The drivers then attempted the same procedure of contacting the signaller, but being unable to do so as the phone was broken. They then proceeded to wait one minute before proceeding with caution in accordance with normal practice. At the same time, V21 working run W534 was heading towards Glenbrook, at which time the driver was told by the train controller in Sydney that uh, there was an issue with 41.6 and that he should just trip past it. The driver of the interior open train, upon encountering signal 41.6 and finding it a stop, he then contacted the signaller and asked for authority to pass, where this conversation ensued. I might pass it, mate. Yeah, mate, you certainly are. The authorization, the colloquial speech, and the early conversation with the train controller led the interurban driver to assume the line was clear. The signal at Penrith, having no means of visually tracking the Indian Pacific, and having not heard from it in a while, assumed it had cleared the section. Unfortunately, it hadn't. The interurban train proceeded past 41.6, assuming the track was clear. The driver then sped up to 50 km per hour. Due to the left-hand curve of the cutting and a left-side driver's position, the driver only spotted the tail of the Indian Pacific when it was a little over 100 metres out from the front of his train. Knowing he could not stop his train, he applied the emergency brake and then ran to the passenger compartment, instructing passengers to brace. At 8.22am, the trains collided, injuring 51 and killing 7, including a 5-year-old boy. The reason 41.6 and 40.8 were stopped was due to a power failure between the train sensing track circuit, and as a failsafe, both signals defaulted to stop. The ultimate blame for the accident was inadequate training for both the drivers of both trains and the signaller, alongside inadequate and antiquated communication systems. For the car government, this made things awkward. Seven people were dead, and it was clear that the rail network was in desperate need of more than just a few new additions. The entire system needed a comprehensive overhaul to bring it into the 21st century. To do this, the car government gave the job to Ron Christie, former deputy manager of the State Rail Authority and the head of transport for the 2000 Olympic Games. He was tasked with assessing the state of the rail network and determining the best course of action to ensure it meets the standards of the 21st century. The report, named the Long-Term Strategic Plan for Rail, better known as just the Christie Report, was handed to the Minister in June 2001. But it was not released to the public until May 2002, after it was leaked to the Sydney Morning Herald in February of that same year. Reading it, there's a pretty good reason as to why they'd not want it to go public. It wasn't exactly optimistic. In short, the report stated that the previous car plan was designed around big-ticket projects and not lower-level improvements like track or signalling upgrades and the big ticket projects that there were, weren't enough. His report, instead of planning out to 2010 like the previous car proposal, planned out to 2050 and provided a comprehensive list of projects that would improve the network in the short term, as well as provide capacity in the long term. I genuinely would love to go over the whole thing because it's fascinating, but it's a massive report <laughs> and there's so much in there. So it'll have to be for a future video, but just covering the most interesting items, we have the stage duplication of Richmond, Cronulla and Botany Freight Line. Then the triplication of the Illawarra Line between Hurstville and Sutherland, the main north between Hornsby and Barara, and the Bankstown Line between Campsie and Bankstown, followed by the quadruplication of the East Hills Line between Torella and Glenfield, where a new flyover junction is to be constructed, followed by quadruplication all the way to MacArthur, as well as on the North Shore Line between Chatswood and St. Leonard's. The main north between Strathfield and West Ryde, 
as well as Epping to Hornsby and on the main western between St. Mary's and Emu Plains. The plan also includes the sextuple location of the main suburban line between Homebush and Lidcombe, as well as new flyovers at Homebush Junction, as well as a new freight line between Sefton, Cabramatta and MacArthur, which is later to be followed by great separation of Cabramatta Junction. There is also potential for an extension of the Richmond line to North Richmond, as well as for duplication between Chatswood and Gordon. There will also be new stations, in no particular order. The first is Pipita, on the Olympic Park line, which was in the original Abattoir's branch before it closed when it was converted to the Olympic Park line. The next is the Rimba on the Richmond line between Quakers Hill and Schofields. Then we have the University of Western Sydney on the Western line between Warrington and Kingswood. And George's River on the East Hills line between Holsworthy and Glenfield. And on the Intercity network, we have two on the Central Coast and Newcastle line. First being Glendale Station between Cardiff and Coggle Creek. And then we have a new Warner Vale Station to the north of the existing station. On the South Coast line, we have Oak Flats and Flinders, which both go together between Albion Park and Minamurra. There's also a focus on safety, with signalling upgrades between Glenfield and Campbelltown, around Erskineville Junction, resignalling around Sefton Station, as well as on the Illawarra and Cronulla lines between Oley and Cronulla, as well as the implementation of automatic train protection and communication-based train control. And with all that, we got into the most interesting part, the new lines, the most boring of which is the Western City Industrial Line, which begins at Rudy Hill, travels southeast past the Eastern Creek Raceway and Prospect Reservoir, before rejoining the main south at Fairfield and Bankstown Line at Villawood. This would allow freight trains to bypass stations like Parramatta and Flemington on the way to Trelora and Botany Bay. Okay, now onto the more interesting ones. In order of planned opening, first we have the Chatswood to Epping Rail Link, stopping at UTS Kurungai, Delhi Road, Macquarie Park, Macquarie University, and then Epping. Next, we have the Epping to Parramatta Line, which call Epping, Carlingford, Teleopia, Dundas, Rydalmere, Rose Hill Camellia, and Parramatta. Next, we have the Glenfield to Brinjilly Line, calling Glenfield, Bardia, Leppington, Rossmore, and then Brinjilly. And following that, we have the piste de resistance of the entire plane, the Everly to St. Leonard's Line, beginning at St. Leonard's for diving underground to a station of Crow's Nest, before reaching Victoria Cross, and depending on whichever is more viable, crossing Port Jackson, across the Harbour Bridge, or through a new tunnel. It'll then call at Circular Quay, Martin Place, Park Street, before then reaching Central and Redfern. This line was so important to the project that Christie stated it was essential to be built between 2011 and 2015 in his letter to the Minister. And it was essential regardless of any signalling or track upgrades elsewhere in the network. But anyway, next we have the Mundry Park line, beginning in Epping before calling at Cheltenham, then Koala Park, Highs Road, Castle Hill, Hill Civic Centre, Norwest Business Park, Burns Road, Mundry Park, Rouse Hill, Box Hill, before joining the Richmond Line at Vineyard. Next we have the Castle Ray Line, which begins at Norwest Business Park, before heading to Kings Langley, Langley Park, then meeting the Richmond Line at Quakers Hill, before heading west to Dean Park, Bidwell, Shanes Park, Landillo, Cranebrook, and finally, Castle Ray. If doing this video has taught me anything, it says there's a lot of suburbs with park in their name in the Northwest. Returning to the Southwest, before we move on, a possible, but not mandatory line, between Bankstown and Liverpool via the Bankstown Airport, which while only being an option in the report, I'm going to start advocating for, solely so we can flex on Melbourne. Anyway, all the lines I've mentioned so far are to be suburban lines, using the double-deckers we all know and love. These next ones, not so much. Going from east to west, we have the Central Metro, beginning at DY before heading south through Brookvale, Beacon Hill, French's Forest, Forestville, Roseville Chase, Chatswood, Willoughby, Narrenburn, Crow's Nest, Victoria Cross, Walsh Bay, Wynyard, Sussex Street, Haymarket, Glebe, Sydney University, Newtown, Enmore, Sydenham, International Airport, Brighton La Sands, Ramsgate, Sandringham, Sylvania, Miranda, Carringbar, Woolaware, and Cronulla. Old Christie was playing with fire when proposing the Northern Peaches to Cronulla line. Next, we have the River Metro, beginning at Sydenham, before heading east to Mascot, East Lake, Kingsford, University of New South Wales, Randwick Racecourse, Fox Studios, Paddington, Taylor Square, St. James, Chifley Square, which will have a connection to Martin Place, Wynyard, Piermont, Glebe Island, Balmain, Dremoyne, Hunters Hill, Gladesville, Top Ride, West Ride, Ermington, Silverwater Road, Rose Hill Camellia, and Parramatta, which our final line is the Parramatta Metro, 
which begins at Hill Civic Center before heading to Castle Hill, Balcom Hills, Winston Hills, North Mead, North Parramatta, Parramatta, Maryland's West, Wood Park, Smithfield, Prairiewood, Greenfield Park, Bonnie Rig, Busby, Miller, and finally ending in Hoxton Park. Before we move on, we have two lines that have also ignored it up until now. Christy called for high speed rail. First, the Newcastle line received the most detail with track upgrades through Brisbane Water to bypass the slower section of the track and unfortunately bypassing Wonderbine 2. The long term goal was to have a line running in a new alignment calling a Newcastle, Broadmeadow, Fassifern, New Warnervale, Gosford, which interestingly enough, he proposed running suburban services to. And then on to Woi Woi before heading south to Chatswood, then to Victoria Cross, then into the CBD via Wynyard and Park Street before terminating at Central. The Illawarra line didn't receive much detail. The only suggestion is that it would branch off near Waterfall to proceed a new route down the Illawarra escarpment to Wollongong, bypassing most of the coastal stations. And the line with the least detail is the Sydney and Melbourne route, which branches off of MacArthur before heading south on a new route, bypassing most of the towns in the Southern Highlands. So that's a lot. I had to cut out a lot of details for time. I'm genuine when I say this. The Christie Report was the most ambitious rail plan for Sydney since the work of John Bradfield in the early 20th century. You may have also noticed that some of the proposals Christie brought forth sound familiar, like a lot of his proposed signal and track upgrades, some of which would go on to become part of the Clearways program. And you may also be seeing something reminiscent of the Sydney Metro we know today. So, why didn't it happen? Well, like I mentioned, Clearways led to some of the work being completed, with the Richmond line being duplicated between Quakers Hill and Schofields by 2011, the Cronulla line being duplicated by 2010, and the East Hills line to Reesby being quadruplicated by 2013. Other projects were also built outside of Clearways, such as the South Sydney Freight Line between Sefton and MacArthur, as well as various resignaling projects. One of the proposed lines even got started on. In 2002, work began on the Parramatta Rail Link, with Phase 1 beginning between Chatswood and Epping, along the route as previously mentioned, albeit Delhi Road was renamed North Ride and UTS Kurungai was dropped. Once complete, work would then begin on the line between Epping and Parramatta. But this section was dropped in 2003 on the grounds of low patronage. The Epping and Chatswood section would open in 2009, however. The ball really got rolling in 2005, though, with the Metropolitan Railway Extension Plan, which consists of three projects. First, the Northwest Rail Link between Epping and Rouse Hill. Then we have the CBD Rail Link between Chatswood and Redfern and then the Southwest Rail Link. So, it seems Christie's plan is coming to fruition. Well... In 2005, Carl resigned as Premier, so the Health Minister and Labor right member, Maurice Lemmer, took his place. Lemmer had a problem. The Metropolitan Rail Extension Plan, and by extension the Christie Report, would be expensive, incredibly so. And he knew, in order to remain in government and avoid Sydney becoming a congested hellhole, he would need to build a lot of new infrastructure, fast and cheaply. He identified a few key issues. According to Lemmer, Railcorp was tied to old-style industrial practices and high engineering standards, which even if it were under control, the sheer cost of all the upgrades and extensions could not be afforded by the state. There was also the issue that while a new rail corridor into the CBD was needed, Lemmer didn't really gain anything from it, since they were all safe labour seats. So it would be money spent for no real political gain. So how to get around the issues, of Rail Corp and to fund the much needed rail expansion. Well, Lemma, and now Treasurer Michael Costa, turned to privatisation. The state of New South Wales would privatise the electricity grid, where the proceeds would then go to fund rail expansion projects in cooperation with private companies, who would then build a new rapid transit system using lightweight and smaller trains to save cost. Yeah, if you remember the whole kerfuffle around the recent power sell off in New South Wales, you probably already remember that this was not popular to say the least. And it wasn't. To test the waters, in September 2007, the Lemma government announced the Anzac Line concept, which started West Ride before heading west to Ride, Gladesville, Tremoyne, Rizal, Piermont, Wynyard, Martin Place, St. James, Moore Park, UNSW, Barubra, and Malabar. As was just a concept, the full plan would have to wait until after the November 2007 federal election, as the need for privatisation resulted in the Rudd campaign asking Lemma to delay the full announcement until after the election. Once the election was over and Rudd was Prime Minister, in March 2008, the Lemmer government then announced Metrolink and the energy privatisation. Metrolink was consist of the North West Metro, which started St James, before heading west via Martin Place, Wynyard, Piermont, Brazil, Dremoyne, Hanley, Bladesville, Top Ride, Denison East, Epping, Cherrybrook, Castle Hill, Hill Centre, Norwest, 
Kellyville and Rouse Hill. This will be followed by potential new lines down to Malabar, following the Anzac Line concept, and a new line between the CBD, Parramatta and Westmead. Metrolink also included the construction of the Southwest Rail Link, albeit as a suburban line, unlike the others. So anyway, you can probably guess unions and Labor Party members weren't all too happy with this whole privatisation thing. Long story short, at a Labor conference in May 2008, a vote was held on the proposed privatisation, which was shot down 702 to 107 against. The opposition, led by Barry O'Farrell and the Greens, opposed the policy, and many Labor MPs also threatened to vote against it. In the end, Lemmer and his treasurer Michael Costa both resigned in September 2008, and with that, Metrolink and Lemmer's political career was dead. Not long after Lemmer was gone, a new Premier was chosen, and this would be Nathan Rees, who was both a member of the Labour left faction, unlike Lemmer and Carr, and very new to Parliament, with him only being elected to Parliament the year prior. Like Lemmer before him, he knew that in order to win the next election, he needed to come up with a proper transport plan, but he needed to create one from scratch. So his government created the Sydney Metro Authority in January 2009, and created a plan for two new lines. The first was Westmead to the CBD and Northwest by Parramatta, Camellia, Silverwater, Olympic Park, Strathfield, Burwood, Five Dock, Leichhardt, Camperdown, Broadway and the University of Sydney, Central, Town Hall Square, Martin Place, Barangaroo, Wynyard, Piermont, Roselle, Dremoyne, Henley, Gladesville, Denison East, Epping, Cherrybrook, Castle Hill, Hill Centre, Norwest, Kellyville and Rouse Hill. The second started in the southeast at Malabar before heading to the city via Maroubra and then onto the northern beaches. One thing I need to make clear here is that on the Wikipedia article for City Metro 2008, it specifies the stations for a second line and discusses a third line, which would be Macquarie Park to Olympic Park and then onto Hurstville. The reason I'm not going into detail on this is because I've not seen references to this info in any of the documents I've seen, nor have I managed to track down the source of Wikipedia users. If you happen to know it or where to find it, please contact me because I'd love to give it a look. But since I haven't got evidence, take what's on Wikipedia with a grain of salt. But anyway, to reduce costs, the metro will be staged, with stage one consisting of the central to Roselle section of line one, known as the CBD Metro. This will cost 5.3 billion and was designed to carry 30,000 people per hour using five car trains, with 24 trains per hour per direction in peak and 12 in off peak. Or in simple terms, one train every two minutes and 30 seconds in peak and one every five minutes off peak. Sounds like a lot of capacity, right? Well, it is. It's just the expected usage will only be about four to 5,000 people in peak and two and a half thousand off peak, which means most trains will run empty. And it was expected to effectively remain that way from opening in 2005 until 2031, even with the Western section opening in 2017 and the Northwest section opening by 2018. They did consider boosting patronage by terminating 26 Western line trains per hour at Central's country platforms, but dropped it when they realized it was impossible to do so. They also considered extending it from Central to Camperdown and Broadway and terminating Parramatta Road buses there. But this also never went anywhere. I don't even have to say anything, but as you can tell, there were no feasibility studies done. And this whole project idea was rushed and not properly thought through. That 5.3 billion price tag was also egregious considering the Christie and Carr government's Redfern to Chatswood line was expected to cost the same. It carries 16,000 people in peak hour. The Sydney Metro plan was so bad, the chief of rail corp said it risks crippling the city rail network if it goes ahead, and that the metro route should be used for the Redfern to Chatswood line. So with all that, would you be surprised that Reese resigned in December 2009 and was replaced by then planning minister, Christina Keneally? I guess rightfully so, Keneally canned Reese's Metro project in February 2010. But like Lemma and Reese before her, she needed to have a transport plan and fast because Labor's basically just spent the past five years f***ing around and next to nothing has actually been built. So with the next election being in March 2011, something would be needed because going to the election and saying, vote Labor, we're not gonna do anything and just waste money, probably not gonna win votes. So what was Keneally's proposal? First, the Northwest Rail Link which is basically the same as before. Starting at Epping and then calling it Franklin Road, Castle Hill, Hill Centre, Norwest, Burns Road and Rouse Hill. Next was the Southwest Rail Link with stations at Edmondson Park and Leppington. And finally, we have the CBD Relief Line, which will consist of a new tunnel into the city beginning at Redfern 
then stopping at Railway Square, City West, and then Wynyard. So, this project is actually quite interesting. It went by a few names, including the Western Express, and would allow Western Line trains from Richmond and Penrith to use the main lines. So if you don't know, the main suburban line is divided into three track pairs. The local, which is, as you can guess, is used by local trains between Strathfield and Redfern. Then you have the suburban tracks, which are currently used mostly by Western and Northern Line trains, and only allow stops at a few stations. And then you have the main tracks, which is used by intercity, country, and long distance services. And they tend to run express through that section. So as I mentioned before, the idea of the city relief line was to allow Western Line trains to use the main and suburban tracks to access the city. Okay, so why can't they just use the main, run express to the city, and then just head through the city circle like normal? Well, they can. Just the only way to do so is via a flat junction between Redfern and Central, which only really exists as a contingency. Main tracks were only designed to serve the terminal platforms at Central. So this flat junction limits the amount of trains you can run. That combined with the fact they need extra timetable slots, and since the North Shore Line and City Circle are effectively full, they'd have to cut trains elsewhere. So the only real solution is a new pair of tracks that branch off the main and enter the city that way. It's actually not a bad idea when you think about it, but in the end, it doesn't really matter, since Keneally led Labor to one of its worst electoral defeats ever at the 2011 election. Because who could have imagined that doing nothing for six years would have been unpopular? Also the whole massive corruption thing didn't help. It's kind of impossible to talk about 2000 New South Wales Labor without mentioning it. For 2011 has come and gone, now the Liberals are in charge under Barry O'Farrell, and they waste no time getting started on a transport plan. In June 2012, the Sydney's Rail Future Plan was released, followed by the long-term Transport Master Plan in December. Speaking candidly, the one thing that sticks out about these reports is that the Liberals stuck to their guns, as a lot of the projects proposed were actually built. The main one was for a metro, later announced as Sydney Rapid Transit, and then just Sydney Metro. Which, side note, having two different metro projects with the same name made researching this video a blast. Anyway, their proposal was to build the Northwest Rail Link, but instead as a rapid transit line. From Epping, it would then use the Epping to Chatswood Rail Link, which opened in 2009. It would then proceed under the harbour into the CBD, for branching into two directions. The first is towards Bankstown, Cabramatta and Lidcombe, reusing the existing Bankstown line, while another branch would travel south along the Illawarra line to Hurstville. For the most part, excluding the Hurstville, Lidcombe and Cabramatta connections, that's what they built, or began building. With Sydney Metro Northwest opening in 2019, with the expected opening of the line to Sydney coming in 2024, and the Bankstown line conversion to open in 2025. In 2014, when the decision on a harbour tunnel was formalised, so was the choice to have the line travel to Bankstown first, and then Hurstville at a later date. This report also set out two optional stations, first at Barangaroo, and the second at the University of Sydney, or Waterloo. In the end, Barangaroo and the Waterloo options were taken up. One thing I've yet to mention is how they plan on funding this. This came in two forms, the first being redirecting funding from the Epping to Parramatta link, as the Gillard government had promised to contribute $2.1 billion to the $2.6 billion cost. However, the Gillard government refused to cooperate and refused to allow the funding to be diverted to the Northwest Rail Link. Even when business cases for both lines were done and they found the Northwest Rail Link to be more economically viable. The fact it was an election promise for Gillard probably played quite a large factor in this. Anyway, the other was by reviving Maurice Lemmer's power grid privatisation plan. And unfortunately, due to the Liberals being more on the pro privatisation side, the power privatisation was able to go through, and the metro operations were contracted out to the Northwest Rapid Transit Consortium. This is all quite hypocritical, in my opinion, since it was Barry O'Farrell and the Liberals who became out and staunchly opposed Lemmer's plan. Although funnily enough, O'Farrell wasn't able to lead the Liberals in achieving this, as he resigned after being investigated by ICAC for an undeclared gift, although he was cleared of any wrongdoing. Either way, in April 2014, he resigned and Treasurer Mike Baird took his place. Anyway, let's focus on the Northwest Metro for a bit. As mentioned prior, it was used in Northwest Rail Link alignment, starting at Rouse Hill, with stations at Kellyville, Norwest, Hill Centre, Castle Hill, Cherrybrook, and Epping, where it will connect to the Epping to Chatswood Rail Link. However, there were additional station locations proposed, those being Kujigong Road and Samantha Riley Drive, of which both will be approved. Kujigong Road became Talawong, and oddly enough, Samantha Riley Drive became Kellyville, and the original Kellyville became Bella Vista, which I'm sure will come up in pub trivia sometime. 
I also want to take a quick moment to bring up the lack of an extension between Talawong and Schofields, which the final line did not have, and as you can probably remember, not quite a few former proposals, although they terminated Rouse Hill instead. This is especially egregious, as they're only 4km apart, and until recently, this was all greenfield development. As for why, I never found a reason in any report. My assumption would be that when the original route was gazetted in the 2000s, they probably decided just to continue with it as it is, and that the Schofield extension was just cut to save cost. Although, that's entirely an assumption. With that, as mentioned prior, the Epping line would reuse the existing Epping to Chatswood rail link, and then eventually, onto the city at a later date. Uniquely for Sydney, the line would be completely automated and use platform screen doors. While complete automation was a new idea, even some of the early renderings for the metro trains showed what appeared to be a cab. What wasn't necessarily new was platform screen doors, as Lemmer's metro proposal also planned to use them, as it was heavily based on Paris's Line 14. And as this video goes on, I'm only now realising that the Liberals basically just copied Lemmer's proposal. Moving on, the trains themselves are based on Alstom's Metropolis design and are built out of stainless steel. They draw power from the standard 1500 volt DC overhead line, with the motors being controlled by an insulated gate bipolar transistor variable frequency drive system, which then drives 16 270 horsepower three phase asynchronous motors, with two motors per bogey on the motor cars, which are the four center cars in a six car consist. One thing to note is one of the authors of the paper that provided the technical specifications is David Jahan, who wrote a very good book on the history of Tulloch and quiet engineering. So if you enjoyed John Dunn's History of Comment series, give Jahan's work a read too. I highly recommend them. Anyway, the trains are a typical metro style design, being single deck with three doors per side per car. Oddly, the internal seating layout seemed to change sometime between 2015 and 2016, as early renders from that era showed longitudinal seating on one side and transverse on the other, but this was later changed to just longitudinal. I'm assuming they changed it for a reason, probably to increase standing capacity, but one of my main opinions on City Metro is that it should have at least some transverse seating, because it's just how long the Northwest Line is. One final topic is livery. Early renderings use this very ugly yellow, blue, and white livery, but that was obviously only a placeholder. The next major livery was the Sydney Trains one, which I think was pretty snazzy. But sometime in 2017, it was changed to the Metro Library that we know today. So moving on, 2014 comes around and tunneling on the Northwest Rail Link begins. In 2015, work on the above ground Skybridge section begins, with trains beginning delivery in 2017. And by 2018, the Chatswood to Epping line closes for conversion, with the line officially opening on the 26th of May, 2019. While it had some hiccups, including a train overshooting a stop mark, it proved successful. And that brings us to today, 2023. So what's next? Well, it's 2023 now, and as I mentioned before, the Chatswood to Sydenham section of City Metro is set to open next year. This new line calls it Chatswood, Crow's Nest, Victoria Cross, or diving under the harbour and reaching here at Barangaroo. And then Martin Place, Gadigal, Central, Waterloo, and then Sydenham. After that, it's Sydenham to Bankstown 2025, which just reuses the existing Bankstown line. And for both openings, I hope to be there. After that, we have two new lines under construction. The first is Sydney Metro Western Sydney Airport. Announced in 2018, with construction beginning in 2020. It begins at St Mary's in Sydney's west, before heading south to Orchid Hills and Ludnam, before reaching the new Western Sydney Airport, where it stops at the Airport Business Park, Airport Terminal, and onto Western Sydney Airtropolis. The line is currently planned to open in 2026, alongside the new airport. There are also some planned extensions, but I'll talk about them in a bit. The second line is Sydney Metro West, announced in 2016 by the Baird government with five preliminary stations planned. One in the Sydney CBD, the Bays, Olympic Park and Parramatta, with a potential total of 12 stations with additional passing loops to allow express trains to overtake all stops trains. In 2018, the first draft of additional stations were announced, with stops at Westmead, Camellia or Rydalmere, an interchange with the Northern Line at either North Strathfield or Concord West, then North Burwood, or Five Dock, Kings Bay, and then Piermont. In 2019, seven stations were confirmed and three were put on the optional list. The confirmed stations are Westmead, Parramatta, Olympic Park, North Strathfield, Burwood North, Five Dock, and the Bays, with the final city terminus yet to be decided. The three optional stations are Rydalmere, connect to Western Sydney University's campus there, Silverwater, and Piermont. In 2020, Piermont Station was confirmed followed by the terminus at Hunter Street in 2021, which would integrate with existing Martin Place and Wynyard stations. Ultimately, the station at Silverwater and Rydalmere were scrapped, which caused some controversy as it meant the section between Olympic Park and Parramatta, as well as Five Dock and the Bays, would have no stops. 
While the stop at Rydalmere was scrapped as it added an additional three kilometers to the route, and while it would be useful for someone like me who studies at the Rydalmere campus, the goal is to get people between Parramatta and the city. However, other proposed stops would not have this issue, namely those proposed at Camellia, Silverwater and Leichhardt, which are all on the line. The only issue is that adding them would slow down trains, although adding passing loops to allow occasional local trains would fix this, but for extra cost. So if you're paying attention to recent politics, you're probably clued into where I'm going with this. In March 2020, the then Perrottet, previously Berejiklian, previously Baird government, lost, and a new Labor government under Chris Minns was elected. One of his first actions was floating the idea of either delaying or cancelling the line outright due to cost, or adding more stations, of which the review is currently underway. If you're my take, cancelling or delaying is out of the cars. $8 billion has already been spent, so the expected cost is $25 to $27 billion. It really wouldn't save all that much. And delaying would only risk ballooning the final price further. It's not even viable to do so politically, as most people support it going ahead, so canning it would only lead to Labor potentially losing the next election. As for adding more stations, I'm all for it. In my opinion, stations should be built at Camellia, as that would allow the area to redevelop, and would mitigate the loss of Camellia's old railway station that closed in 2020. A station should also be built at Silverwater, as that would greatly improve public transport access to people working in the factories and warehouses around there. And Leichhardt, as it would allow the area to densify and provide much needed public transport access. And I'd fully support an extension down to Zetland, which is apparently under consideration. I do understand that the point of this line is to connect the CBD and Parramatta in 20 minutes, and adding more stops will only extend that. But as long as it's less than the current suburban service, which takes 28 minutes to get from Parramatta to Central and 34 to Wynyard, which is the closest to Metro's Hunter Street station, it should still be able to take that slack. Assuming those extra stops only add an extra 10 minutes of service, which probably is a bit much, you're still getting Parramatta to Hunter Street in 30 minutes. This is even ignoring the option of passing loops to allow express and all stop services. But those add costs, and that's probably not a wise idea at the moment. Either way, the digital stop should at least be safe marked for the future, and the line should not be canned, because if Minns does, I'm betting he won't be Premier at the next election. We also have the elephant in the room, and that's the incompatibilities. I'll keep this brief because RM Transit did a good video on this topic, but in short, the Northwest and Western Metro use trains of the same size, but the Northwest line used 1500 volt DC overhead, same as Sydney trains, while the new Western line will use 25 kilovolt AC overhead, like most new mainline railways. This is made even more annoying when you factor in that the Western Sydney Airport line will use the same AC electrification, but use wider trains. Annoyingly, this means Sydney will have three metros, all of which are incompatible with each other. While this isn't unheard of, it's often the result of different lines being built at different times by different people, not three lines being built in one big batch. And it has some issues. Namely, that you can't move rolling stock from one line to another to meet a shortage, or do bulk orders to replace lots of trains at once, and the recent shenanigans for the light rail show that even if you don't plan on running trains together, having them be compatible is a bonus. Because if the light rail trains weren't, there'd be no Dulwich Hill service at the moment. So in my opinion, at the very least, the West Sydney Airport line should be changed to operate stock that is compatible with the Western line, as transitioning to 25 kilovolt AC, in my opinion, is a valid reason to change a standard. So moving on, what's next? Well, I'm going to keep this section short, most because this video is too long already, and because Building Beautifully has done a really good video on it already. So returning to the Western Sydney Airport line, it is one main extension, that being from Airtropolis, south to Oran Park, Norellan, and then on to MacArthur. As an example of good planning, the land for this route has already been preserved, and you can see it in the zoning maps for Campbelltown City Council, as well as the proposed extension of the Southwest Rail Link from Leppington to the new airport via Rossmore. There is also a proposal to extend it north to Schofields via Marsden Park, where it meets an extension of the Northwest Line from Talawong, which in my opinion, should have been built when it opened in 2019. There is also a proposal to extend the Northwest Line from Bankstown and onto Liverpool. Now onto the Western Line, on its western end, the proposal to extend it to Prairiewood and then to parallel the airport line between the Airport Business Park and Antropolis. On the eastern end, it's proposed to take it down to Zetland, as mentioned prior, but then onto Randwick, Maroubra Junction, Malabar, and La Perouse. Now we get onto the new lines. Going east to west, first off, we have the Macquarie Park to Randwick Line, beginning at Macquarie Park, going south to Ride, then Rhodes, Olympic Park, Strathfield, Campsie, Kingsgrove. Cogra, Kingston Smith Airport, and then Randwick. Next, we have the Richmond, Reesby, and Regions Park line, which begins up north of Richmond before heading to Blacktown, then Parramatta, and Lidcombe, where it then splits in two, with one route going to Liverpool via Chester Hill and Cabramatta, while the other goes on to Burwood, the CBD, and then taking the airport line to Green Square, Mascot, Walleye Creek, Kingsgrove, and Reesby. Finally, we've got the Norwestern Miranda line, which starts at Norwest before calling at Balcombe Hills, Parramatta, Chester Hill, Bankstown, Kingsgrove, Cogra, and then Miranda. 
I do need to note that everything here is just a proposal and may not be built. The timeline for this is only 2056, and it's only a preliminary plan, which is why only major stations are mentioned. Just like how the Western Line was planned, they announced the major stations and then decided on the final stations before construction. And with that, this video comes to a close. And holy hell, it was a long one. The script is 9,300 words total. And I don't know how long this one will be. I'm gonna probably guess close to an hour. So if you've stayed to watch this far, thank you. <laughs> to give my opinion on City Metro, I plan on doing a video on its flaws in depth in the future. But in my opinion right now, it's ultimately a good project. It's just a shame that it took so long to get off the ground. It's a shame that Labour in the early 2000s had to mess around for so long because we need transport infrastructure badly if we want to see Sydney grow without constraining itself through congestion. Hopefully, the Minns government sees a light and doesn't cancel the project because God knows if they do, they won't be in government next time. But with that, if you enjoyed, please like and subscribe. It really helps the channel. If you really want to support my work, you can find my Kofi in the description below. Any one-time or ongoing donation is greatly appreciated and doing so will get your name in the credits. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. What's up, Rail Roos? Today, we're going to be railing some roos. I'm going to cut that. I'm going to cut that out. That was from this report. <coughs> Discussion. <laughs> what the fuck was that? As an eve of privatization resulted in the Rudd campaign, asking the lemma, asking lemma. Oh, boring. You get a good day out. A good day out, where I get to stand for six hours, okay? We're nearly done. Get sank, We're get nearly done. Hydrant. We're nearly done. No, we're going on strike. <laughs> no, you're not unionized. You're not going on strike. If you unionize, I'll beat you. <laughs>